All right. So we are trying along. We just about at the halfway point, crossing over the halfway point of Acts. Um, today we're going to look at Acts 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. I know it sounds like a lot, but we're only going to look at like specific uh, sections within the book. And if you haven't read the chapters, no worries. That all will kind of explain what's happening um, in the story. So uh, as we move on to chapter 16, just to kind of recap just briefly about what we talked about last week um, and where we are in, in the book. Um, so chapter, uh, let's see, I think 13, yeah, 13 and 14 are Paul and Barnabas's first missionary trip. Um, and we meditated on a couple, uh, you know, elements of their, of their missionary trip and, and really what it is to know your audience and, and to tailor the message uh, according to the audience. And then uh, last week, we looked at chapter 15, which is a really important chapter because it's the Council of Jerusalem. And, and we had such a great discussion last week. It's, it's hard to kind of summarize all the points that we talked about. Um, last week with respect to the council, I mean, just in, in brief, like when we, when we talk about, you know, the ecumenical council or really the, this first council of Jerusalem, it, it served as the, the basis for all the ecumenical councils that would, would, would come in the upcoming centuries. And, and it really taught us a couple things. Like one, like how did the church discern the will of God? Well, we have a word for that. It's called conciliarity. Right. And that is we discern the will of God together. All right. But to discern the will of God together, we have to incorporate another idea, which is ecumenism, which is of the whole household. So everybody comes together and everybody discerns the will of God together. Everybody being like all the leaders of the church. Right. And and we knew that James um, was the Bishop of Jerusalem, and he really presided over this, even though you had two key pillars of the church, which were St. Paul and St. Peter, who were also present. But because James was the Bishop of Jerusalem, he was given that honored seat, right? Um, but James didn't act alone. He acted in unison with all the other uh, apostles who were present. And and another beautiful thing that we that we were meditating on last week with respect to this council was that the decision that came out of the council factored in so many different things. Like it, it factored in Jewish belief. It factored in like Jewish culture. It factored in, you know, where the Gentiles were coming from and what the Gentiles were struggling with. And and how do we how do we appreciate and embrace like where the Gentiles are coming from, what they're struggling with, their mindset versus Jewish mindset, and how it all boils onto this point of circumcision. And what we're saying is that like the goal was salvation for all, right? And so we couldn't like that. That was the overriding like focus is like we want we know that the Great Commission was for all people to be baptized, right? All people to be saved, right? But we see that there's a hindrance for the Gentiles because of, of the law of Moses. And, and while Gentiles like wanted to, to come in and, and be part of the faith, right? And, and remember like Christianity wasn't really Christianity at this time. It was like under the Jewish umbrella and under the Jewish umbrella, you had, um, Jews who followed the law of Moses and, and but believe some of them believed that Jesus was the Messiah and they were considered people of the way right people of the way that's how they're referred to in the book of Acts or they'll, they'll be referred to as um, a Nazarene somebody who believed in, in Jesus as the Messiah right so this all happening under the umbrella of Angel uh, uh, Judaism and then you have the Gentiles who wanted to believe and become part of the faith but they're looking and saying like whoa this law of moses too difficult and so they're staying on the outside they're like i'm not crushing the threshold because the law of moses is too difficult to bear 
And so the church had to reconcile like these, these challenges and they reconciled it with this letter that they produced from the, the council in Jerusalem, which said, okay, don't worry about circumcision, but we do have some things that you need um, in your life, which is to avoid from sexual immorality, avoid from blood and from things strangled, right? Which are key things that the Gentiles struggled with. And kind of going off that point, what we're saying is that like these were small things like in our eyes, like clearly like, sure, somebody would need to keep themselves from sexual immorality and not drink the blood of other animals and not, you know, eat things that have been strangled, right? It's simple for us, but, and, and we can look at it and say like, okay, but they have so much more to do. But what the church realized is that this is what they could do at the time. This is what we needed them to do because we wanted to bring them in. And over time, they will grow, they will mature, they will be enlightened by God and, and continue to change their ways. But this is what they're able to handle, right? And we're saying like when we bring other people into the church that we need to appreciate where they're coming from. We can't bring people into the church, like, like a new convert into the church and be like, well, you got to fast Wednesdays and Fridays. You have to kiss the icons and wait till Lent comes around. There's 55 days and there's no fish in addition to the no dairy and the no chicken. And like, we can't add all these things to their plate, right? It's too much for them. So we have to see where they're coming from and give them what is appropriate and trust that God will bring them the rest of the way. Right, so there's so much to learn from the Council of Jerusalem. But as we move on, we finish the Council in chapter 15. And now uh, Paul and Barnabas have a fight. And the fight is over uh, Mark because Mark deserted them or left early on the first missionary trip. And this really, really bothered Paul. Barnabas was okay with it, like, and you, you could claim that there was, they had that familial relationship, which would make Barnabas slightly partial to Mark, but also it's in the character of Barnabas to take people under his wing. That's what he did with Paul, that's what he did with Mark, and as he took both of them under their wing, they both grew and did amazing things, right? We have, you know, this whole, you know, two-thirds of the book of Acts is really dedicated towards Paul. And we know that Mark came to Egypt and established a church and really had a mighty service. And, and we really can look and find the common denominator uh, that really helped them out in their low times was Barnabas, um, which is why he's our patron saint and, and the son of encouragement, right? Because we all need that encouragement. So we have Paul and, and Barnabas split ways. Barnabas takes Mark, goes on a trip, and then Paul picks up Silas. All right, or sorry, uh, Silas and Timothy, All right? And we're going to get into Timothy uh, soon into chapter 16, right? So it's right before, or just about as he's starting his second missionary trip, All right? And when we go to uh, chapter 16, we'll read the first five verses. It said, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of all the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, um, to keep which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem, right? So what does that tell us? Like this area that he's in, is highly Gentile, but there is a, a Jewish uh, presence there. And he's carrying on the degree, decree in chapter 15 to the Gentiles, which should ease their ability to come into the church, right? He's trying to help them come into the church. But while Paul is continuing to focus on the Gentiles and his ministry is kind of shifting more towards the Gentiles, right? He still wants the Jews to be able to listen. He wants the Jews to be able to hear. And as he's finding different people in ministry, right, he finds Timothy, and Timothy has a circumstance. His mom was Jew, but his dad was Greek. And back in those days, you followed what the father did, right? So he wasn't circumcised. 
And so Paul, even though just in chapter 15, we just determined that, okay, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. And Paul right away takes Timothy and circumcises him. Kind of funny, right? A little bit strange. And the question for us to wrestle with is why? Why go through all the hassle of, of, of the Council of Jerusalem, which was a big deal, to take away the burden of circumcision and take away the law of Moses and then take Timothy and say, all right, <laughs> time to get circumcised, right? Why does he do that? What do you think? Could it be because um, Paul was more concerned with, because he was a Jewish scholar, like he was concerned with keeping it up, even though they had already agreed to and not to, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. That's a good thought. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address that. You're right. He is a Jewish scholar. So maybe to avoid conflicts, I guess, or I don't know. I mean, I, I see that here. It says a couple of times the Jewish woman who believe, but his father was Greek. What, why they kind of refer to was Greek a couple of times later on, it says also, I think his father, they kept mentioning like his father was Greek. I know that it follows the father, but was Greek people at the time not believers or? Well, they were believers, but they didn't like Greeks. Some of the Greeks were starting to believe based on yeah. the preaching of Paul. But th what they didn't want to do which at the time was, you know, okay, you want to believe? You, you have to join the Jewish faith. Well, in, in order to join the Jewish faith and be part of this sect of Jews which believed in Jesus as the Messiah, well, you still got to follow the law of Moses because that's what it meant to be Jewish, okay. right? So you can follow the law of Moses and believe that Jesus was the Messiah at the same time and still be Jewish, right? So okay, so are we still obligated to have circumcision now for our kids? I mean, since uh, I'm, I'm a little confused hygienic, with the... That's a hygienic and like personal preference, with like, you know, circumcision for the males today. Um, you don't have to, but it's just more for hygiene purposes. Um, yeah. But, you know, when we look at this, like, and, and what I'll say is like, to, to, to kind of touch back on Kara's point, like, just to let you know, like, where's Paul's mindset? Like, Paul wrote Romans, and Galatians is a summary of Romans, which pretty much says we don't need the law. Like, Romans is Paul's masterpiece of a letter, right? And he goes through a beautiful argument of why we don't need the law, but yet we see him here saying, I'm going to circumcise uh, Timothy. And the reason is, is because while we... Well, the decree said they don't need to be circumcised. Just because something is written doesn't mean it's widely accepted, right? And even though, and, and because it's not widely accepted, there's always this like kind of gray zone, so to speak, as something is being implemented. And there's got to be a little bit of give and take, right? So Paul's essentially taking Timothy, circumcising him. Why? Because he wants to open up the door to preach the message of the gospel, right? And so in order to do that with the mindset and the mentality, like he had to come onto their terms, right? He had to join their playing field with Timothy. And in order for them to join the playing field, like he had circumcised Timothy, right? It's kind of a weird playing field, but that's what it was, right? Was Paul, was Paul the one said, I will be Jewish to the Jewish and- Exactly, Paul did say that, okay? Why? And at the very end, he's at, so that I may save some, right? That was Paul's mindset. Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes without breaking, like, the law of God, without violating his truths. I will do whatever it takes to save some. That was his mindset. So for him to circumcise Timothy, it's a small thing. Why? Because he was like, I just need the door to be open. And I could talk to them, and then we'll bring them. Okay? 
So that was his mindset. And so it's always important for us as we're bringing people to the church, as we're talking to our coworkers and friends, like we don't have to lay unnecessary roadblocks for them to believe and take them where they're at and trust that they are starting a journey. All right. So that's what happens with Timothy. And then they go to um, Macedonia and, and then from Macedonia, they go to uh, Philippi, and in Philippi, they get in trouble, right? And in Philippi, they are um, put in jail. And this is another one of the times where, you know, there's a jailbreak. First one was with Peter, and now this is with Paul. Uh, Paul and Silas are in the prisons, and, uh, you know, there's an earthquake. The doors open up, and the guard who's guarding them, is just about to like kill himself because he's like, oh my gosh, if they find out that all the prisoners left on my watch and that I was sleeping during this watch, like I'm going to die. So he's going to take his life. But, but Paul says, nope, don't do it. You know, turn to Christ. You'll be saved. Him and his family are, um, are, are baptized. And while, you know, they're in Philippi, okay, and they're in prison, Right, the rulers of Philippi are trying to figure out what to do with Paul and Silas. And and then the next morning, when they say, Okay, call for Paul and Silas from prison, and they realize like, well, they're not in prison and 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 they're out, you know, Paul and Silas waste no time getting back to the ministry. So they figure out where Paul and Silas are, and they bring them in you know, to, to the council in Philippi. And they start to say like, look, you know, you guys need to knock this off and you guys need to leave Philippi and leave quietly. And then Paul pulls out his Roman citizenship, right? And he holds it over their head. He's like, you want me to be quiet? You think I'm going to get in more trouble with you? You guys are the ones that chastised and whipped a Roman citizen. And once they realize he's a Roman citizen, they realize like they're in trouble because you don't, you don't whip another Roman citizen. It was one of like the perks of being a Roman citizen, right? So they didn't do their homework. They didn't get all the facts when they did all that. And, and so Paul is knowing his rights as an individual, right? As a Roman citizen and using it which is something like we all need to do, you know, in our ministry, like is to understand the law of the land, to understand, you know, the environment, the government and all these things and use it. Like just, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but as a church in America, like, sure, there are some strikes against us because we're a nonprofit, we're a religious organization. We can't tap into certain things, but there are things that we can tap into. And so it'd be good for us as a church to be wise about these issues, to research these issues, and to leverage them for the better, for the good of the ministry, right? To, to, to know what rights we have as, as citizens in this country, as a church in this country, and so on. Because the times are getting sticky. The issues are getting sticky. And the church is going to have to face these issues. So as a church, like, we need to know what our rights are. And there's nothing wrong with using those rights, right? As long as they never violate God's law, right? That's the ultimate law. That's the supreme law that we never, we never violate. But as long as the law on the land fits under God's law, we're okay to use it. All right. So that's 16. We're still in the first missionary trip. And as they're kind of moving along their path, they're going to come to Berea, which is in chapter 17, verse 11, right? But before Berea, okay, they leave Philippi, they go to Thessalonica, um, they minister there, and as they're ministering and discussing and struggling with the Jews in the synagogue, and they do this for, for three consecutive Sabbaths, all right, that eventually the Jews get really, really fed up with Paul. And, and the way Paul's ministry worked is like he entered the city, he went to the synagogue, he started to preach, and some Jews listened, most Jews did not. The Greeks 
and the Gentiles were always standing at the door, kind of listening in and trying to figure out like, hey, what's Paul saying? What's he like? What's the message of today? All right. And this is how he he ministered in the cities. All right. And it was frequently the Jews who got really frustrated with with the message. And as Paul continued to argue the message and the message made sense. Right. Because what was what like we've discussed this before um but anytime you're going to make a case for jesus as the messiah to a jewish audience you're going to be throwing out names like abraham moses and david right these are these are like key figures that you're going to talk about in order to make a case that jesus was the messiah and the argument for Jesus being the Messiah was so strong that it was just infuriating Jews, right? It was infuriating the Jews. And so the Jews would always gang up and begin to attack. And then Paul would have to leave the city. Sometimes he'd leave the city after being stoned. Sometimes he would leave the city because his disciples were like, get out of here. They're going to kill you. Sometimes he would be whipped. Like he left under the worst of circumstances, but he would just go to the next city and start again. All right. And while we look at Paul as being one of the most influential apostles of all time, I mean, you know, he has more epistles in the New Testament than any other author. He was so influential in the early church. And even to this day. It's something for us to really think about because, you know, even though Paul was so influential, and very persuasive in his argument. What do we what do we frequently hear? That the Jews were upset, that the Jews rejected the message, that the Jews didn't want to listen, and the Jews started to attack him and, and run him out of town. And the reason why I bring this up is because we frequently ask the question: well, how do I convince somebody of the faith? How do I like make this great argument that is gonna be so compelling? that this person in front of me is going to believe. Well, Paul was of the most compelling people there were in the history of the church. Right? His arguments, his eloquence, he was an educated man. As Carol pointed out, he was a, scar he was a, a Jewish scholar. He knew the books inside and out. His story was amazing of being you know, a Pharisee of Pharisees and then converted and this mighty you know, apostle for, for the Lord. Like, you just can't find a, a more passionate, convicted, you know, apostle and so well-rounded, right, in his knowledge. But yet, what was the response most frequently is let's run him out of town. Let's get him out of here. Right? So how does somebody convert? What are the, like, the key elements for somebody to, con to convert, to believe. And that's what we find in Berea. After he leaves Thessalonica, we get to Berea. And let's read verse, uh, we'll start at verse 11, uh, or 10, 11, and 12, where he says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women, as well as men. Right? And this is really important because, while we can make arguments and we can know what the arguments are with respect to the background of the person in front of us. You know, whether they're atheist or Scientology or Buddhist or Muslim, you can know the arguments, right? And there's a, there are great and, and solid arguments and, and solid reasoning to defend our faith. But what really is essential for the conversion of somebody is what we see in verse 11, right? Because they heard, they listened, and then what did they do? These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily 
to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Right. And it's important to, to see these elements, like when we're talking with people, because initially in any conversation, people will be attracted to your faith, right? Our personal faith in Christ is, the, is in, in a lot of cases, the initial attraction point, right? For somebody to the faith. But what's our goal for them to develop their own faith in Christ. What will that require for them to read scriptures, for them to spend time daily in scriptures, for them to think about it, ponder it, ask questions, do the research. And it's in that process that one believes, right? Because if their heart is open to believing and they want to believe, then they'll go through the process. But if somebody like is just resistant doesn't want to read, doesn't want to, you know, search the scriptures, doesn't want to listen to the arguments. There's, there's nothing that we can do. We can't twist their arm and force them to believe. It has to be that choice, right? We have to do the things on our part that are important. We have to be able to kind of know, like, some discussion points, right? Engage in a conversation. But we have to be able to point them to the Bible. We have to be able to speak from the experience of our own personal faith. Because if, if we can't speak from the experience of our own personal faith, then our service towards others, our you know, response to the Great Commission is always going to be half-hearted. It's always going to be weak if we don't have our own personal faith. Right? And, and this really falls in line with uh, one of my favorite quotes by church father Evagrius of Ponticus in the fourth century, where he says like, oh, I'm going to butcher it. If you're a theologian, you'll pray truly. And if you pray truly, you will be a theologian. Okay. Pretty sure that's how it goes. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it goes. But his, his point was that we look at theologians and we, and we try and, and turn or deem them as like the academics of the faith. And he kind of like rearranged that and rewrote that. And he was saying like, if you're a theologian, you'll pray. Right? Because our knowledge of God invokes and brings about a relationship with God. Right? And if you pray truly, then you'll be a theologian. So if you're really praying, who will you know as a result of your true prayer? God. Then you speak of God as somebody who is very personal to you. Right? And that's, that's the theologian in, in, in the Orthodox faith. It is somebody who, true, like, who knows God personally and from personally knowing God, like through prayer, like can speak of God with such, you know, detail and articulation and passion, right? That's what a theologian was. Somebody who spoke about God with such knowledge and passion, but it all stems from a life of prayer with God, that communion with God, right? And that's what we want people, when we share the gospel, when we follow up the Great Commission, we want to tie them into the Lord. Any questions so far? Uh, I do have a couple of questions, Aruna. Mm -hmm. So, first question is, when you said about the Jewish, are, so the main arguing, like the main point they're arguing is they are still waiting on the Messiah pretty much, right? Because they're expecting, so I guess from, I guess they just can't accept the fact that Jesus came and was born like in, a yeah. barn and like this this is like not the fact they want to see god being poor and um like just don't, they're expecting jesus to come as like on a cloud i mean i don't i mean how they are expecting the messiah to come then if that's yeah, they were they were expecting a powerful ruler to come to overthrow the romans and jesus came as like a suffering servant so they they just it, it's not what they expected out of a out of a messiah 
And so they couldn't are believe they, it was the Lord. Are they basing their expectation based on some parts of the old scripture or just because that's what the God is great and they're expecting God to be, you know, coming on the cloud or something like well, that? Is it like from their own? The Romans. They expected God to overthrow the Romans and the Romans were powerful. Yeah. Right? And Jesus came and they didn't overthrow the Romans. So it, it was kind of a, a huge barrier for many of them to believe that this was the Jesus who was prophesied about. Okay. Right? They were and expecting my, a great military leader. Yeah. My, my second question, I don't want to be too long. And when you said that, uh, you said Paul um, will do his best so he can save some. Uh, is that. Does that include, like, was, or will that kind of define why some Catholic church will have the LGBTQ community flag on their church? I mean, is that even something that we should do in order to kind of, because I, I've met some, like, lesbians or gays, friends and work or whatever, and then some of them, they're actually believers or they are seeking, they are, they are truth seekers, but then they when you get to this issue, it's kind of like a, you know, sensitive uh, subject where it's like, oh, so God doesn't love you because you sin something that I don't sin or, so how can you tackle this with, when it comes to specifically this subject? Hmm. Uh, that's, that's a great question. I think it's a bit of a complex uh, question, but here's my two cents on it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to, you know, qualify that with this is my two cents on it. Um, because I'm not going to speak on behalf of the church. But in my experience with churches that are putting up the LGBTQ community flag and the rainbow flag and all these different things, and they, they term themselves as an accepting community, right? Um, I think is... The re I think it's interesting, okay? And when they come and look at us and say like, okay, but you don't put the flags on so you're not accepted. Well, I don't think that's the case, right? Because are we accepting? Of course we are accepted. But, and this is my big but in this situation, is God accepts all people unto repentance, he accepts all people unto repentance, right? So it doesn't matter what you're coming into the church with, okay? He accepts us and calls us for a life of repentance. What were the beginning words of his ministry? And they were preceded by John the Baptist. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He called us into a life of repentance. He called all people unto a life of repentance, right? So when you look at that, that means... The alcoholic, the gambler, the person with addictions, the homosexual, the cheater, all right, they're all accepted unto a life of repentance. Repentance in its like at its core is this turning of, of my way to God. Right? And so as I'm turning towards God, he becomes what I'm working towards. And everybody, all right, everybody who comes to God is going to be changed to be more like him. And so to say, like, we're not an accepting church, I mean, I don't think it is correct. We, anybody can come. And we accept all, and God accepts all, to a life of repentance, which means everybody is changing. Nobody has like a higher hand than somebody else in the church. Now I say that, and I can appreciate that certain struggles in life, okay, affect people, you know, the community in different ways, right? So to be honest, like, if somebody from the LGBTQ community were to come to church, can they come? Yes. Can they be accepted into a life of repentance? Yes. Can they struggle with their same-sex attraction? Like, yes. Okay. And as they struggle in this to accept, like, the conservative biblical view of what sexual morality is like, like, can they be part of the church? Sure. 
you know, is it going to be more of a struggle for members of the community? Yes, because like we're, we're broken and we have a lot of like social biases, cultural biases and things like that, that really make this difficult. Um, but, you know, for on the flip side, like if an alcoholic comes in, you know, and is struggling to be sober, the ripple effect in the community is a bit different, right? It's not as significant, or I would imagine it not to be as significant, right? Sadly, I would say that because of cultural biases too, the church, when it comes to, you know, spousal abuse, you know, is more accepting of that sort of behavior, which it really shouldn't be, right? Because there's too many, like, you know, there's too many times where we, like, just try and downplay the significance of, like, a husband beating his wife, which is totally unacceptable. Right, so our cultural biases and and the society that we live in, like, play a part in kind of the ripple effect, so to speak, of of when anybody comes into the church with their struggles. But the truth is, like, we accept all. God accepts not we. God accepts all unto a life of repentance. Plain and simple. Any thoughts, questions, arguments, disagreements? You can throw two at me, but I ain't going to go through uh, Zoom. <laughs> Isn't there an explanation, though, that, like, we're all there because we are sinners and we, you know, we're, we're seeking God to, to, you know, to work in our life and, and change us. But with the LGBT stuff constantly rammed down our throats. <laughs> Number right. two, um, I don't know if these, like the Methodist church and all those people, like they, um, I don't know if they're viewing it the same way as the Orthodox view. They may not necessarily all think that it's sinful. I mean, I don't know, because I think in the Methodist, Methodist or Episcopalian or something, there's some kind of rift or the Methodist, Methodist church. It's about to have a major rift because of this issue. Yeah. And then when they had the, their big um, annual meeting here in the States somewhere, um, they wanted to accept it. And then it was stopped actually by the African um, delegates. Yeah. The ones from Africa were so conservative. They said, this is wrong. Yeah. And that's why they did it. And now they're looking to separate. Yeah. But, they, you know, them and others don't necessarily seem to, you know, a portion of them don't necessarily think that this is wrong mm -hmm. and that we're there to work towards getting over that sin like we would theft or um, alcoholism or heterosexual adultery as well, you know. I, I agreed. I agreed. So it's a basic, like... <laughs> yeah, they, I mean, some churches that are quote unquote accepting which is a terminology that's thrown around these days are just saying like well, like you can practice this lifestyle and it's 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 you know in alignment with scripture right and and that's where we differ we we say no it's not in alignment with scripture um and and neither is alcoholism heterosexual abuse you know addiction none, none of those things are in alignment with scripture. All of them, like the individual needs to be transformed into the image and likeness of God. Um, so, yeah, that is a really good point, Carol. Really good point. Abuna, can I add something that I, uh, I think it's, uh, I mean, I can't really speak also on behalf of whether it's Catholic or any other, domination but i think especially some of the churches like other than the coptic or the orthodox church in general i'll say they are struggling a bit financially to keep it up because of like 
not a lot of people nowadays, especially young professional people that can put money on donations to churches. So in a way, they do know that the LGBTQ communities kind of get a lot more money than other community. Like they are sinners, I mean, like others, but they kind of focus on that in a way to just to maybe bring some finances to the church or then they say by that way they kind of help them. But I, but again, I, I guess it's uh, like it's also cultural for us, like you mentioned, and we're, you know, but as we're biased and or, just, or cultural differences, especially with like Egyptian and or Eastern in general, this is a very sensitive topic to even speak about in the church or even mention it. But I don't know. I mean, here's the question. Uh, do you think, Abuna, that the, like I find it weird because I spoke to a couple of these people and they, they, they mentioned some of them, they don't, they don't actually feel they want to do, but then they said I get a lot of like some of them, they do get help financially or they get they kind of get supported when they actually do this and do you think is this is there a heading agenda somewhere or there is like is there is something that's coming or i don't understand like how they like why there is a big money invest like why this is like why this is a big issue i mean <laughs> do you think satan is really doing something mean, i don't i mean try to get to the bottom of it Just, i mean the thing is behind a lot of these issues like for sure there, it, it's an agenda and I can't see why this is particularly you can't see it too much. I mean, you see it in alcoholism, like you said, you see it in a lot of other stuff, but this is becoming very, very like it's like it's like um, it's like really that they're shoving it down our throat now. And it's, it's a weird it's like why particularly this is this like it kind of uh, I don't know, like I don't know if you notice down the street here on Phil, uh, from St. Paul. They have a community, like there is a neighborhood where they have the LGBTQ community living there. They, they give them houses there or something like that. But anyway, they paint it down the, like the whole on the pavement, like the whole street. Uh, black, a black trans LGBTQ community lives matter all the way from the, the beginning of the street, all the way going to, through the, the end of like the neighborhood. And why this particular, like this particular thing now becomes like, I don't know, it becomes a hype or why there are so much interest in this nowadays. I mean, I'm sure it's been for look, years. Look, look, I think you're, you're touching on like a very complicated like question here in the States that has many layers to it. And I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not educated enough to speak to all the different layers that you're, that you're asking about. Um, so I, I don't know. I think it, it is a bit of a social movement and there's so many layers to it. So I, I just can't answer that. And I'm like, I, I don't want to attempt to because I don't want to misspeak, you know, because yeah. I don't know what's going on on their end. <coughs> we can only focus on our own end, right? And understand like, where do we stand in this? Because will we be tempted at times to bend certain things for money, sure. The church has done that in the past and it has not been good and has turned away people. And we can't like bend what we believe to be true for the sake of money or social pressures. We have to stay strong in what we you know, believe. And, and are we up against like tall order? Sure. We are. How the church right now is dealing with you know the sexual abuse like issues you know don't be surprised in a couple of years when this issue explodes too because we haven't dealt with it well we're gonna have to yeah all right how about this we got eight minutes and I have another meeting starting right at nine so I'm going to try and wrap up chapter 17 for us. Um, but that was a good discussion. So we're in uh, Berea, and then we move over to Athens. And Athens is interesting because Athens is just like another example of, of how Paul teaches us to know our audience. All right? And, and like we've said a couple of times before, talking to a Jewish audience, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, the prophecies, 
law of Moses, all these are going to be in the preaching. So here, we're in Athens. Jews are out of the picture, okay? Or they're the extreme minority in the picture. And now the audience is different, right? And Paul tailors his according. But the one thing I want us to notice as we read the upcoming verses, while he tailors the, the, the message to the audience, he doesn't alter like what the apostolic preaching was in those days, which was, right, that you and I are sinners, that we need a savior, that Jesus Christ came, was incarnate, saved us, rose from the dead, and because of that, you and I have life. That was the apostolic preaching. Now, the challenge was to always fit those key points and tailor it to the person or the audience that you're speaking. Right? So, yeah, go ahead. Oh, that's amazing. Um, let's start with verse 22 in, in chapter 17. We'll end on this point. And Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the object of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship with knowing him, I proclaim to you. Right? Now here, in the next verses, this is key where Paul finds common ground with his audience. Okay? God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped, with men's hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Remember, he's talking to, like, Greek mythology. Like, these are people who believe in Greek mythology. God of the water, God of the earth, God of the air, Zeus, demigods, like, people who are, like, you know, half God and half human. And the God, like, found his power by how much he controlled or how much he was praised, right? So he's kind of hitting on all these points. And saying, the God that I'm speaking to you about, like all your God here. The God I'm talking about, boom, he's up here. Right? But he's finding common ground, common language. Right? Verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord, that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, right? Which is interesting because there was a huge distance or gap between Greek gods and the people. What made them gods, right, were like almost how untouchable they were by the people. And then Paul is saying, here are your gods. Here's the God I'm talking about. And not only is he up here, he's down here with us. Right? So he's kind of like blowing their minds. For in him we live, verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to drink that the div we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something sharpened, shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now command all men everywhere to repent. Right now, he's getting into the apostolic message, right? And, and here, here, like these points come out. So he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man he has ordained. He's talking about Jesus, the man he has ordained. He has given assurance to this to all by raising him from the dead. Right? So all, like we're all going to perish, but because God wanted to draw close, he ordained somebody. Jesus Christ, to come and to 
allow us to escape the punishment of death, whom he had ordained and given assurance to this, of this, by raising him from the dead. How did he do it? By dying and rising again from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed among the among them Dionysus the Arabagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. All right. One minute to kind of close up because I gotta to jump to my other meeting. But even though Paul knew he was probably going to lose many of them when he talked about the resurrection of the dead, he didn't sway or avoid the message of the gospel, the apostolic message, the message of salvation. And we have to like embrace this fact that as we talk to people about Christ, that some of them will just like, they'll tune out when they hear certain points. It's part of it. But we can't change the message. We can't alter the message or soften the message. We can tailor it to the audience, but the key points have to be there. Right? The key points always have to be there. And if we lose people, we lose people. It's part of, part of ministry. It's part of life. And it's almost a proof that everybody has their own free will to believe or not to believe. And then it requires somebody to believe. Okay? All right. Next week, we'll do 18, 19, and, and uh, 20. We'll finish off the last part of Missionary Trip 2. And, and then finish up the third mission trip. All right? I'm going to pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you for this day. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would uh, guide us, and that you would help us to be uh, courageous in how we share the message, that we would tailor the message to those in front of us, but that we would never... Um, sugarcoat the message that we would truly speak the gospel uh, be with us lord help us to be courageous and learn along the way through the intercessions of all your saints to a pleasure from the beginning here says we say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thank you thank you thank you thank you us our trespass as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil christ jesus our lord for thine kingdom and power and glory